It is a delight to see all of you this morning, and uh, we are going to, uh, we get to celebrate, uh, we're celebrating uh, a resurrected Christ and our enjoyment of Him. I hope that you came in here this morning looking forward to enjoying Him. Um, also, during uh, our service, uh, uh, Jackie and Blake are going to share a bit of their own testimony of, of the Lord's work in their lives, and so I'm looking forward to that. But right now, um, I want us just to bow together, uh, and because of the grace of God, and because of the mercy of God, uh, we want to bow before Him this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we, we've come today. Uh, frankly, anticipating seeing each other. Um, we've come uh, to let you know that how important you are in our lives. Um, we want you to know that, that we love you and we only want to love you more. And uh, Father, we're thankful for those great passages in Scripture that says things like, uh, he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, um, that work is ongoing. Um, sometimes we can see it. We can, we can look at what's happening and the things that we're learning in those, in those experiences, the good ones and Maybe especially the hard ones. Uh, and Father, so I pray that you'll continue to bless our, those who lead us in this part of the worship time. It's all worship, whether we're listening to your word, or we're praying, or we're singing, or we're taking communion. It's all worship. And I thank you for that. Uh, I thank you for these that serve us through singing and instruments and blessing. Uh, Father, more than anything, more than anything else, we want Christ to be exalted. And we, we, we want people to see how, how marvelous Christ is. So their lives, too, can be changed. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Ephesians, or Ephesians, excuse me, 5 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the world. Walk as children of the light. Amen. <clears throat>
taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. O oh Lord my God, I will give you my thanks forever. Thank you, Father. I search the world.
brought food and spent time making the food to help our kids be successful. I think everybody had a good time, and we're probably going to have a bake sale coming up soon, so I'll be looking forward to that. So thank you guys. Along that same note, uh, we actually have someone who, in our church, uh, who gave uh, the church some land in order to build a building here that will be for our kids and our youth. It's going to be, uh, it's really exciting. Um, and uh, she ultimately is giving the church a half a million dollars in order to build this building. And, uh, and uh, we've been talking with the builder, Carol Caldwell, and he says he knows we can what we want, we can build it for that. And so that's pretty exciting because we don't want to go into any debt. And so a lot, of, a lot of exciting things, but uh, so glad that you're here. Right now we come to this part of our worship uh, where uh, we get to enjoy what God has done. Testament, one chapter a day, and uh, today we're in, in, in Mark 14. One of the things that, um, that Jesus did while uh, he was spending some time with his disciples is he gave the bread out, and then he came to the cup, and he gave thanks. It represents the blood of Christ. He gave thanks. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to be painful. He gave thanks. How much more should we, or can we give thanks for the shed blood of Christ? He gave everything. Everything.
Romans 8.15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And now we're going to be passing good, good Father. So sing along.
come back to 1 John, uh, the third chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 3, and um, we are recognizing some things in this book. One is, is that uh, the book was written for several reasons. One, primarily, that you see, and that is that we would know that we have eternal life. God wants us to, to be able to... Uh, uh, to walk through life, walk through our journey with all of its stuff, and quite frankly, life can be really hard at times. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, he wants us to be able to walk in confidence. But there's also something else that he talks about, and that is about the deception that, that is in the world. Remember last week we talked about Sun Young Moon and how that he wanted to, uh, you know, his whole... Uh, teaching was that Christ uh, uh, was, uh, uh, he had made a mistake, or the, 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 the uh, followers had made a mistake, and they, that, that he, was, he was killed, he was murdered, but he was supposed to uh, set up a kingdom by having, getting married and having children. And like I told you last week, that uh, there's a, uh, there's a hundred thousand active members in Japan that are following still Sun Young Moon, even though he died back in, I don't know, 92 or something like that. Uh, but then the Bible also talks about something rather unique, and that is that, uh, that, that uh, we can deceive ourselves uh, if we're not careful. It says a lot about, well, if you say this, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. It says it like about a half a dozen times in that first chapter, which is, if you say, if you say, if you say, but, wait a minute, but if you confess your sins, <laughs> you know, if you recognize your need for God, and uh, there's just several things that he talks about. One of them is that you would love your brother. Uh, Jesus' prayer in John 17 was, and I believe that it is constantly being answered. He says, Father, I pray that they would be one even as we are one. That's a powerful, divine occurrence to happen. But quite frankly, I think it's happening all the time. Um, I get around people who are believers, and i got to tell you, uh, people who love Jesus, I, I enjoy them. We may not agree on everything, but man, I tell you what, it's enjoyable to be around other believers. Amen? It's just really enjoyable to do that. He prayed that they would be one. It's real easy. Wherever I go, if I get to run into a believer, someone who just simply has this, uh, uh, this uh, love for Christ, it's enjoyable for me to be around that person. Well, and then another thing it talks about in this book, it talks about the, just the inner change that happens, the uh, the desire for something different, uh, something that the world does not pursue. Uh, I want to read this passage with you. Uh, I want you to see this. Really, the title of the message, when, when the children of God become unrecognizable. Uh, I want you to look at these three verses together. We're going to be referring to several in this chapter Right here in chapter 3, these first three verses, notice what it's like to be a believer here. You ready? It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. What great songs we just sang concerning that. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him, Jesus. Beloved, now we are children of God. Wow. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. It is so interesting that what happens as a believer, um, our lives begin to change. And I'm not talking about all of us at times 
uh, where, where, where our attention and our affections go in one direction or another. But God doesn't leave it like that. He which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he keeps working. He keeps drawing you back. He keeps drawing you back. Because there is nothing any more fulfilling than that. Uh, remember what Peter said whenever the people began to leave, when he was talking about some pretty hard things in John chapter 6. And Jesus says, will you leave me too? And they said, well, uh, Peter said, well, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Because, he, because Christ was so, uh, so appealing uh, for a believer, someone who recognized him. And I'm going to use this term, and I really want you to think about this term that it uses at least three times here in, in 1 John. He talks about being born of God. Being born of God. In other words, that becomes the, the difference that happens in somebody's life whenever God brings life to them, whenever God brings, uh, you know, his divine presence into their lives, you see. And so their encounter, remember the first part I talked about, when we touched him, we heard him, uh, and, and all of these experiences that they had with Christ, and then he talks about, because of that, they have fellowship with him. They're having fellowship with him, and we want you to join with us in having fellowship with him. We can enjoy one another, as he talks about in 1 John. So I want to bring up those three thoughts real quick, and then uh, I just want to kind of run through this. Uh, and uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask uh, Blake and Jackie to come. And, uh, you know, uh, I have known them for quite a while, and I have seen uh, the changes that have happened in their lives. Um, by the way, um, by the way, the changes that happen, we don't, there's not like a, a rule book in terms of, well, this should have happened in your life. Listen, God's changing people. I don't know all that he's doing. I don't know all that he's doing in your life. But if you spend any time with him at all, you will not be able to help but begin to change. These three thoughts, I, again, what I'm just trying to do is I try to give like an overview of what's, what we're going to talk about. And it is one, there are, there are clear distinctions that set you apart as having been born of God. Uh, the Father's love is so profound that, 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 and life-changing that we become unrecognizable to a world that really is simply in love with itself. And we're going to talk about that for a moment. That's really just in love with themselves. We become unrecognizable. Our greatest ambition is not to build a life that is conformed or becoming like the world, but rather being transformed into the image of Christ. That's what we want. That's what we want in our lives. And so I want to just share a couple of verses, and then they're, they're going to come and, and share some things. Because this is really important. For example, if I were to give you a synopsis of, of Romans 6, 7, and 8, I would go like this. And I, I, we could go on and, and go back to chapter 1. But if we're, I were to give you a synopsis of of, of Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. Those of you that are familiar with it. See, in chapter 6, it talks about this, uh, this, this doctrinal truth that has happened. The Bible says that, 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 that we died with Christ. In other words, the old man is, is, has, has been separated. Has been, <laughs> the, the power of the old man has been uh, taken, taken to the side. That's in chapter 6. Chapter 7 then talks about how that we wrestle with that. How that, how that we, um, how can we, uh, uh, you know, because I do what I don't want to do and I, I don't do what I should do. We, we, we wrestle with that. Uh, because the uh, Galatians 5 says that the old man wrestles. And so sometimes we find ourselves being pulled back and forth. All of us do that at different times. But it's because the Holy Spirit is there now. Now there's all of a sudden a wrestling, whereas there wasn't a wrestling before. It was just kind of whatever I want to do, whatever it is I feel, whatever it is I think about. And so, so, so there's that the doctrinal side where something occurred. 
When you believed, all of a sudden, this old man, because you've been born again, this old man has no longer has the power that it once had. Chapter 7 then says that the, we wrestle with it, and then he asks the question at the end of chapter 7, and he says, who can deliver me from this, this body of death? And then here's what he says, thank God through Jesus Christ the Lord. That's what he says in, John chapter, in Romans 7. And then you go to chapter 8, and then it begins to talk about, wow, those who are in Christ, there's no more condemnation. Watch this. And then it says, it says the Holy Spirit then helps us. And he helps us with several things. What, you ready? He helps us with, uh, with the struggles in life. He helps us overcome. The Holy Spirit helps us overcome the power of the flesh. Watch this. And then he teaches us about the love of God that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And so there's this doctrinal side that God did and he's doing. And then the, 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 the practical side where we're wrestling with stuff. And, and be, why are we wrestling with it? Because the Holy Spirit resides. Otherwise, there would be no wrestling. And then we find that how we overcome is because of Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And he helps us to pray. What it even says in Romans 8, it says that we cry out, Abba, Father. We cry out, Abba, Father. We, 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 you know, by the Holy Spirit helps us cry out out the Father, and then we, and then we grieve, but at the same time, He helps us to pray. It's a marvelous thing, and it's not, it's, it's a, His burden is light, but, but boy, I'm telling you, sometimes because we've allowed ourselves to be, to be fed by the flesh so much, the, the war is just so much harder. But if we walk in the Spirit, if we walk in the Spirit. It's amazing what God does when, uh, when Christ comes into their life. Like, and Jackie, if you'll come and, and, uh, and share a few things with us this morning. very loving. My dad was absent, uh, but my mom and my mom made me feel very loved. Me and my, my siblings were very loved. My grandma had a way of making people feel like they were the most important people in the world, and she did exactly that with me. Um, we always attended church. We went to a Pentecostal church when I was very young, and then as I got a little older, uh, my sister would take us to Temple Baptist Church on Sundays and Wednesday nights. I think she had friends that went there or something. And I remember um, after a youth service when I, I laid in my bed and I cried out to Jesus to save me. And um, then I was baptized at 12. <clears throat> and then shortly after that, we were invited to South Carolina Baptist Church um, by Miss Paula Gregg, a remarkable person. Uh, we fell in love with that church. They had an amazing youth group. We were in a tiny room with, we would have 40 kids some nights. Um, James and Dana really kind of took me under their wings, and they poured into me, and um, I was diving into scripture, I was reading the Bible, you know, praying, and um, I began to lead a Bible study at my school, and then th they left the church, and I kind of fell, you know, back, wasn't really going to youth functions <clears throat> when I was 17, and then I met Blake, and um I first started dating him, and my parents told me, no, you're not going to date him, which is probably the reason I fell in love with him. Um, so, you know, we were partying, and we were drinking, and um, I was sneaking out to be with him. I compromised my beliefs, um, and sin kind of just enveloped me. And um, I'm going to let him share a little bit of his childhood. Mine's a little bit different than Jackie's. I'm not going to say I didn't grow up in a loving home. I, was, I grew up in a great loving home. It just really wasn't the best scenario sometimes. We weren't led by God. My house wasn't led by God. I didn't go to church. I never, I really never went to church until I, I met Jackie, and she was pretty adamant about us going to church. And sometimes I would fight, but a lot of times I would go. But uh, I, had, I had friends that would invite me to church, and uh, we would go to South Caraway on a Christian Church right down by the YMCA and a lot of the times we would go for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then we would sneak out and we would go run around in the town but you know that's just, we were 16 year old kids so uh, after let's see here let me get this in this 
stuff. I had a when I was 16, I had a horrible car wreck, which I lost a uh, a really good friend of mine in that car wreck. And this this statement is something that I've held pretty near and dear to my heart for a long time. I really didn't know what it meant at the time because, like I said, I didn't have Jesus in my life. But one of my friends said, God has a plan for you. Because I had one friend die and another one that was pretty badly hurt. Uh, after that, let's see, I met Jackie. Still didn't have Jesus in my life. But she was, like I said, very adamant about us going to church. Uh, we had Julie. And we were, I was 18. She was 17 when she got pregnant. But uh, I still didn't have Jesus in the life then. I was a drug addict. I drank. I did pretty much anything my heart wanted to do because I didn't have Jesus leading my life. Okay. <laughs> um, like you said, you know, we had Julie. I was 19 when I actually had her, but um, I wanted to be a good mom. And he wanted to be a good dad, but he just didn't have that. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. But anyways, I prayed. I prayed for two solid years that God would make him to be the father and husband that I needed. And I, I remember, um, and I, we were living in sin. We were doing drugs. It was, it was bad, bad place, but I just remember. And sometimes I would just, I would be high, and I would be crying out, like, God, save him and make him into the man that I need him to be. Because I wanted so badly for my kids to grow up in a two-parent household. Um, so one day, he after, like I said, about two years solid of me praying this, he, he came to me and he was like, I, we're not going to live like this anymore. And um, at that moment, I knew that that was God answering my prayer. Of course, that's not what, exactly what he thought, but, um, but I knew that that's what was happening. And so we started to make a conscious effort to change, to stop being around the people that we were around um, and, and live better lives, not fight, we were fighting, and it was just a, a really bad place, but that's kind of the changing point after we had been praying, I had been praying for so long, so, um, you know. Had I known that at the time, I would have known it, but it explains a little bit, I had this feeling, an overwhelming feeling that, that I needed to change my life, and at the time, I just thought it was for my kid, because, like I said, we only had Julie at the time, but it was... God answering her prayers and the Holy Spirit coming into my life. Uh, what really was the changing point was we got pregnant again with Monroe. And I was just, she had just had Monroe. And I'm standing in the hospital room and I just, Jesus crushed me with my sin. He, he said, you're a sinner and you need to repent for that. And I got down on my knees in that hospital room and I prayed that Jesus would come to my life and change me. And he did. He's changed me for the better. That's for sure. I was baptized. I was baptized in July. I was 27 when uh, Jesus came into my life. Monroe was born. Uh, he was born in May. And two months later, July, Don baptized me at South Carolina because that's where we were going to church at the time. Uh, oh, yes. I'm sorry, I've got all this wrote down. But from then on, you know, I, I forever. Have, have changed more and more. You guys have, a lot of these people here have seen me change. I mean, I went from a drug addict, an alcoholic basically that lived selflessly just for myself all the time to an elder of this wonderful church. I lead communion now on, on occasion. Uh, I, I run a pretty successful plumbing business and it's all because of what Jesus did in my life and come and said that I'm a sinner and that you need to change and live for me. And that's what's happened. I, I live for God. I, I, I thank Him every day for everything that I've had and everything that I get coming to me still. Uh, it's all because of Him. And now I know what that friend, God's plan was this, to get me in front of you guys and tell you how much Jesus can change your life if you let Him come into your heart. Right. Right. Okay. There you go. Uh, would you guys like to pray with me? Yes. Father God, I pray that our message today is a light to someone here to see what your love can do in a wicked sinner's life. Lord, I thank you so much for coming into our lives and changing us to do your work and give you glory. We love you with all our hearts and we're forever grateful for your son Jesus and his love for all of us here today. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.
exactly what we're talking about here in the scripture <coughs> is that uh, uh, there's an absolutely incredible uh, occurrence that can happen in your life. Um, you do not have to create it. You don't create this. Um, it's being born of God. It's uh, the Bible says that it says that no no one comes to me. Jesus said, no one comes to me unless the Father draws them. <laughs> and so it's a work of God in your life. And if you sense that movement in your life, man, don't, don't let it go away. Don't, don't allow it to go away. I love that passage. Uh, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. And I would encourage you, man, I would, I would encourage you to go on a fast of... Uh, of, of, of television for a week or so and just, just allow yourself to be immersed in the love of God. And see, one of the problems that, that John was dealing with was that there was a, there was a deception uh, out there. There's a deception about who Christ is, that uh, some were saying that he didn't even come in the flesh. We find that later in chapter 4, that some were actually saying that. And some were saying that he wasn't really the Messiah. And, and, and the Christ. And we, wanna, we want to realize that there are those false teachers and all of us are, are susceptible to that. In fact, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said, if it were possible, the deception is going to be so severe that if it were possible, even his own would be deceived. But, but, but because of the Holy Spirit, you ultimately won't be deceived. But why go off in some kind of direction, some kind of tangent, because some weird teacher tries to lead you off into something crazy? I'm just telling you that it's all in Christ. Everything that you desire, everything that you need in, in your spiritual life, in your emotional life, is really found in Christ. He's blessed you with the people around you to fill other, other things in your life. But Christ is that one. It's so absolutely incredible. I want to, if you'll bring up the passage of 2 Timothy 3. I think I gave you that one. 2 Timothy 3. And it goes like this. <clears throat> but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Verse 4. Uh, no, yeah, verse 2, excuse me. Uh, For men will be lovers of themselves. Men will be lovers of themselves. We're talking about that they, they're, they're only engrossed in what they want, and God has no place, no place of authority, no place of, 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 uh, of, of authority or relationship. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. We've never seen that. Unthankful, unholy, verse 3. <clears throat> unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal despisers of good. And then verse 4, traitors, watch this, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's why it is so unique when you see somebody walking around <clears throat> and, and they actually have this love for God and, and you just hang around them a little while and that seems to, to fall out of their lips eventually. You just listen to somebody talk for a little while and you'll find out what they love the most. Just listen to them for a while. Just listen. Keep listening. Don't, not, not as a judge. Not as a judge. Just care about people. But after a while, you'll figure out what it is someone absolutely loves the most. <clears throat> and so we come back to this place. We recognize that, uh, that we... Um, uh, We've been changed. And, 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 and like I've told you before, and I'm going to try to close with two verses here, we, we, uh, we, this change that takes place, it goes like this. Maybe not all exactly the same for all, the same order for everybody, <clears throat> but what happens is, is that faith begins. Faith begins where you, uh, boy, you just recognize that that you need something. Uh, you recognize that your sin has, uh, has overcome you. You realize that it's something that now you find yourself even sorrowful for. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and 10. He says, you know, he says, uh, if you'll bring that up, uh, he says uh, that, you know, there, you know, 
I'm glad that you're sorrowful. He's talking about that guy that was that they had to let go out of the church because of his sin. And he says this, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. Okay. Uh, for you were made sorry in a, uh, in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us, as, as, us in nothing. Watch this, verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, but, but worldly sorrow produces death. But what in the heck is is worldly sorrow. The only thing I can think of, you might can teach me something on that, but it seems to be that they got caught, now they're sorry. Uh, but once but once there's, but that can be, that can still be worked in your life where you come to a place and you go, God, I'm sorry for what I have done or what I have said or what I have thought, and that sorrow leads to a turnaround. You see? And you know who did that? It was God. God is the only one. I can show you several passages, not going to, but uh, but God is the only one that can grant you repentance. I love that passage. I shared this verse with Jackie and Blake earlier, and then I want to close. It's in Galatians 2.20, and it just simply says this. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Let's pray together. Father, I know that, I know this, that you took 12 men, and those 12 men have left a legacy. Because of you, because of what you did, because of the cross, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit and your word, those 12 men have left a legacy, and we are part of that legacy. And I know that you can take the few men and women that are in this room, and you can create more and more of your family by the way we live. The world really does have a hard time sometimes recognizing us. They really don't understand it. The choices that we make. Uh, but it's okay. Your word says that in, in, you know, we, Paul says we've become fools for Christ. We're we're aliens, uh, we're, we're sojourners, and Lord, I, I'm really good with that. As long as I get to walk with you, as long as I get to walk with you, in the good times and even in the bad times, as long as I get to walk with you, as long as I get to walk with you. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I know that you've spoken to us, and I pray that, that if there's somebody here who can say, you know, Don, I don't have Christ. I don't have this Christ that you speak of. We're praying in Jesus' name that if you're like that, then we'd love to pray with you. Would you come so we could pray together? Would you do that? Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. In fact, everybody would be excited. If the Lord spoke to you, come, would you do that? We're going to sing together. How great thou art. But would you stand with me, please?
thank you, Jackie and, and Blake, and uh, I look forward to hearing you share it again in the next service, too, as well. Um, Craig, uh, Manley, do you mind leading us in a closing 